So, hi, um, this is a video lecture for topic 2.4. We're looking at clean technology. So this is the definition from the glossary of terms. Um, so clean technology, you can see is products and services that reduce waste and require a minimum of uh, non-renewable resources. So that's the key thing to remember throughout this whole section is that we're looking at ways that we can implement and start using clean technology either in products, services. Remember what services are. Services are things where, you know, it's not a physical thing. It's like banking. It could be computing. It can be movies. It's, it's stuff like that, uh, food services, um, and then processes. So these can be like manufacturing processes and um, electrical generation, etc. Okay, so that's what we're looking at throughout this whole um, section. Okay. Please watch these two videos. They're going to give you a brief introduction to what clean technology is. This one is from the government of Canada, and this one's somewhere from the EU. But watch these. They're going to give you a, a brief outline of, of uh, clean technology. It's important to understand some of the historical context that we operate under. So one thing to understand is how are humans impacting the environment? So this is from Crash Course. It's on ecology, I know, but uh, ecology connects here when we're talking about clean technology. And we're looking at um, the different ways that humans impact the environment. So go ahead and watch this and, and then come back. Okay, here's uh, the second part of that same um, sort of topic. He's talking in this crash course video about pollution and its effects on the environment. So again, pause me, go over, watch this video, and then come back. Okay, this is a, um, a, a his, another historical concept. And this is sort of case in point. This is a case study of what happens when um, industrial processes and, and uh, you know, they get out of hand. So this is about London's air. And it's it's pretty interesting. You know, London has had, you know, except for the last sort of 50 years, has had historically bad air. So it's an interesting, quick case study. So have a, have a watch of this video. And then what I want you to understand is that when they passed the Clean Air Acts in London um, back in the 1950s and 1960s, this really cleaned up the air. Um, and also prevented, you know, numerous deaths. So have a quick watch of this and then come back and we'll continue on. Okay, so clean technology. Um, from the IB here, they want you to understand that manufacturers will or may respond to current or impending legislation. We'll talk about what, what that means. Um, or pressure from local communities and media. Okay, and the reasons for cleaning up manufacturing can can um, you know include lots of things. They're they're you know promoting positive impacts. Lots of companies today are interested in being seen as as um, beneficial to people because you know bad press is bad press, and if you get um, a, a negative name for yourself, that can have an impact on your sales. So they also are going to try to you know. Um, have a neutral impact and, and uh, minimize negative impacts on natural resources, reduce pollution and uh, energy use, and reducing wastes of energy and resources, you know, including things like water, but also um, non-renewable and renewable um, resources. The less we use, the better we are. Okay, so here's some drivers of clean technology. First thing to understand, though, is that, you know, for many years, there was no incentive for, for manufacturers to want to clean up the production uh, because it cut into their, um, their profits. The whole point of business is to make money. And, you know, they talked about this in the uh, ecology videos. Uh, Hank, Hank Green talked about the fact that the earth does a lot of our cleaning up for us. Um, you know, several trillion, what did he said? Something like, a, it was a crazy number. It's like $46 trillion worth of, of cleanup. It, you know, it does for us just, you know, for free, essentially, right? You know, that's going to cut into your profits. And, you know, no company makes $46 trillion. But, you know, if you are, are required to clean up your water waste and your air pollution and your, your solid waste, 
it's going to cut into your profits. And that's something that, that companies don't want to do because they have a fiduciary responsibility to make as much money as they possibly can. So this is where laws, legislation, so these are laws um, that address a certain topic, right? They are, they're put into place to force companies to do this because often companies will not do this voluntarily. There are definitely companies that will, but there are, are others that need to be forced. And that's kind of government's role in this. Um, so, you know, government is going to, um, pass laws that will, um, that will force manufacturing to clean up. And these could be either current laws or, or laws that are coming, you know, soon, um, companies will conform to these laws or they will have penalties. Now, one, one very important understanding about things is, you know, this is, you know, a, a point about rules. You can have laws, but if you don't enforce a law, you might as well not have it. You know, you can use an analogy with uh, chewing gum, right? At school, we have a, a rule that you're not allowed to use chewing gum, or sorry, to uh, chew chewing gum on, on school premises, anywhere on school. And I enforce that. I don't want people chewing gum in my class, so I enforce that rule. But there are other teachers who don't enforce the rule. So if no one's enforcing the rule, then we might as well not have the rule. And the same thing could be said, for instance, using cell phones or using headphones where you're not supposed to. These things are, are rules, but if they're not enforced, we might as well not have them. Um, another driver of clean technology can be local communities and media, right? So local communities, basically communities don't want harmful wastes, right? You don't want, this is the not in my backyard idea. So, you know, you know, communities don't want to have like a polluting factory in their backyard. They want clean water. They want clean air. They don't want a landfill in their backyard. So basically they're going to say they don't want these harmful wastes. And this is a driver of clean technology. Um, you also have groups such as Greenpeace that, that will act and try to, uh, these are like eco warriors, right? So they're going to be driving uh, legislation, legislation to be developed. And then again, this idea of bad media attention is bad sales. If you have, uh, you know, stories in the newspaper, stories on, on the media about how um, your company is polluting, people are going to decide not to buy things from your company. Okay, international treaties and targets. There's lots of those around. Uh, we're just going to go through two of them. But, you know, the one of them is the, um, this is an older one. It's called the Kyoto Protocols. And what the idea was, it was, it was like, you know, meant to, to reduce CO2. And really when I say CO2, I mean carbon emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions to below the 1990 level. So if you look at this link right here, it's just a quick link. Uh, it's not very long read, but just have a quick um, check of that and, and, and look at what the targets were. So they're looking at reducing, and, and this is also in your textbook, by the way, they're looking at reducing carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions to below the 1990 levels. Um, here's another video about the Paris Agreement. So this is another um, environmentally friendly, clean technology, encouraging type treaty that would set targets for, for countries to um, reduce their, their greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, and so go ahead and watch this video and then come on back. All right, this one's kind of a funny one. Um, this this is not an easy thing, right? Um, these uh, there's lots of issues with um, things like climate change um, treaties, and this is a quick video that will show you some of those um, issues. Now, in in this video, they talk about different countries that that produce oil. Um, and, you know, that's a difficult choice for these countries, because if your primary source of income is oil and people are starting to, to reduce the amount of oil that they're using, um, it can be bad for your bottom line. In other words, you don't make as much money as a country. So um, lots of countries that, that produce a lot of oil are doing things like diversifying their, their economies. So this is, for instance, with, with Saudi Arabia and the 2030 goals. Um, if you look at what Saudi Arabia is trying to do, they're trying to diversify their, their economy so that they're not dependent on oil because that's going to be problematic in the future. And I think Saudi Arabia should be applauded for, for the 2030 um, vision because it is excellent and it's going to help Saudi Arabia become a country that, that is not solely dependent on one product. And it's, it's always 
a worrisome thing if you're dependent on one source of income, because if that source of income goes away, then you are stuck without income, right? And, and Saudi Arabia is trying to uh, diversify in things like tourism. It's trying to diversify in things like finance. You know, this is what Neom is all about. It's trying to diversify in energy production and farming in so many ways. So the Vision 2030 is really an excellent thing. And it's it's forward thinking, thinking that, hey, you know, this is, this is something that's coming down the pipe. We've got to voluntarily change Otherwise, um, we're going to be stuck, dependent on one thing that may may not be as useful as it was in the past. So, have a, a quick look at this, and uh, it kind of explains problems with with um, um, these international treaties on climate change. Okay, incremental versus radical solution. So, these are the definitions of these two terms. So, an incremental solution, basically, these are little baby steps, right? This is evolution rather than revolution. So, using small steps rather than one big step. So, you know, we're improving products and developed over time, leading to new versions and, and generations. And, and often, if you, if you think of this incremental idea, you will get a revolutionary product in incremental steps, but it takes time. Radical solutions are are very fast. So this is where you're you're trying to completely change in one big step. So this is a completely new product that's going to uh, the root of the problem and thinking about a solution in a very different way. So uh, those are radical solutions to, to problems. Okay, let's go on to the next. So for, from the IB here, um, you need to consider um, as approaches for manufacturing, the advantages and disadvantages of incremental and radical solutions. So let's have a look at those. So for incremental solutions, the advantages are, well, use of existing trusted technologies, right? Because it's it's a gradual process, the, the technologies are usually there. It's a matter of, of implementing them. Um, there's very limited downtime in production. In other words, you don't have to stop what you're doing and completely revamp your production line. Right, because it's not a radical change; it's just an incremental change. So you can change one thing at a time. Um, there's less uncertainty because you're using tried and known and trusted technologies. Um, you can quickly respond to legislation. So you can, you know, keep if there's new legislation, you can you can change as you're as you're going. Um, the disadvantage: it takes too long. Right, like if we're worried about. Um, climate change and what we do right now is going to have a big impact on climate change. And, you know, the longer we take to, to fix it, the worse everything's going to get. Um, the small changes may not be enough to meet legislation, so that can be a problem. Um, you're going to need to make small changes all the time. So this is, you know, you're constantly, constantly making small changes. And then it, it, you might be in a, a marketplace that's pretty crowded with competition. Okay, if we're looking at radical solutions, so this is where you are changing quickly. So this is the revolution, not evolution. Um, you know, you're exploring new technologies. That's an advantage. There's a high potential for market growth. Just like any radical sort of change, radical design, you are might be the first one there. So you get a lot of um, share of the market. Um, it could create whole new industries. You know, um, you go back. 50 years, there was no solar industry, didn't exist. Okay, so those people created a new industry. Um, there's fewer competitors. You get to uh, patent your solutions, and this can be, you know, huge financially. And then also, you know, get, you, you get a reputational benefit. In other words, your reputation looks good. So people might want to buy your products because, hey, they like what you're doing. Now, the issue, the disadvantage is super costly, right? When you're changing things very quickly, you've got to throw a lot of stuff out and bring a lot of stuff in. So it's going to be very, very expensive. Um, research and development is expensive. Training people is expensive. Buying new capital equipment. So capital means like very expensive, big machines and things like that. It's, it's very expensive. There's a high uncertainty of success. You're not sure whether this will succeed or not. There's um, a possibility of high market resistance, right? You have to understand that that when you want to change things radically, you're going to have a lot of entrenched. You're going to have a lot of um, entrenched means uh, uh, industries that are already existing. They're going to be fighting against you. They don't want this to change. An example of this might be, for instance, when when electricity 
electric lights were first introduced, well, the people who were making um, kerosene lanterns didn't want electricity, you know, um, electric lights because that was going to ruin their profitability. That's going to ruin their, their business model. And so they fought against it. And they fought, you know, vig really hard against it. They, you know, talked about how dangerous electricity was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and of course, they ended up losing because there was an advantage to electricity compared to um, something like a kerosene lantern. But, you know, the same could be said with, with something like solar panels versus coal-fired power, power plants. You know, uh, coal-fired power plants will be talking about how reliable they are, about how, you know, you, you, const you get a constant flow of electricity and it's better and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that, that uh, um, solar panels only work during the day and they're unreliable. What if a cloud goes overhead? Oh, no, you're going to shut down your electricity. So they're going to be resisting any kind of change to their, their, uh, the existing paradigm. Okay, it's, uh, it's unpredictable, right? Um, you know, development could kind of stop and start, change, and, you know, it, it, it can be an unpredictable process. Okay. Let's talk about end of pipe technology. So this is technology that is used to reduce pollutants and weights at the end at the end of the process. So, you know, basically when you're you know done with the process, what are you doing with all the waste that have been accumulated along the way? So for instance, you know, on this uh, picture right here, we've got raw materials coming in, they're being processed in three ways, and then you've got products coming out. But along the way, you've got some some um, some waste. So one of the first wastes would be your uh, air pollution. So what are you pumping out of your smokestacks? Often uh, in current factories, they have something called a filter in there. And that filter will take out solid particles. Um, and, and then, but what do you do with all those solid particles, right? Like you can't just flush them down the toilet. They have to be collected. And generally they're gonna go someplace. And, and sometimes they can be quite toxic. Um, any solid waste that you have, what do you do with them? Can they be recycled? Can they be reused in some way, or are they going into a landfill? Uh, water consumption, are you using more or less water? Remember, water, I mean, there's a lot of water on the, on the earth, but not a lot of it is fresh water. So, you know, you, you want to reduce that, uh, that uh, resource. And then your wastewater, what do you do with, with the wastewater that comes out? Does it just get dumped straight in the ocean, or is it something that um, can be uh, treated and then returned to water bodies as, as uh, clean? Um, so that's, that's, a this is kind of the idea, like, what are you doing to reduce the, the air pollution, solid waste and water pollution? Okay. And those, those are the end of pipe. And you have to think of it like, think of like a tailpipe on a car. Like what is the stuff coming out the other end? Now, one example of that, of, of an end of pipe technology that is helping to reduce waste is carbon capture and sequestration. So you know, one, one thing to understand is this word sequestration, and, and this is a perfect time to talk about it because it's a bit like quarantining. You know, most of the carbon that was on Earth was quarantined underground in things like coal beds and in oil and gas fields. And the issue, and, and rocks, and the issue is, is that um, we're taking that, that sequestered, that quarantined um, carbon out, and we're releasing it into the atmosphere. Now, one thing that people are doing now is they are actually recovering the uh, carbon dioxide from their from their industrial processes, and they're pumping it back underground so to se sequester it again. So that basically locks it back away underground, so it's not in the atmosphere, it's not creating um, the greenhouse effect. Um, so this is an example of an end of pipe technology that is reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that is uh, in the atmosphere. Okay, and that's carbon sequestration. Okay. All right. Thanks for watching. See you next time.